then you hash and sign the metadata. So this is keeping this kind of three-stage indirection in mind is important um, for the rest of the talk. So the basic structure when you get down into the, the angle brackets of it is you have the signed info, which is our metadata. You have the signature value, which is our signature, and you have the key. So it's those um, parts in the lower right hand of the last diagram. And here's a sample signature. Um, this is about as bare bones as they possibly get. I know this is probably too small to read here for most people, um, but we'll go through bit by bit and take a look at how it works. Um, this signature, again, is just over the object here down at the bottom. So that little bit of black at the bottom is the only thing that's being signed, and the rest of this is just um, the basic kind of overhead of building a bare bones XML signature. So we'll start with the signature value just because we'll go a little bit out over here because it's the most simple one. So this is just your uh, base64 encoded signature of the digest of the canonically signed info. So again, indirected signature. The next part we'll talk about here is our signed info. So this is our metadata blob we've been talking about. Um, this is describing what's actually being signed. And in this case here, again, it's this object down at the bottom that just says some text. And the contents of uh, signed info are a canonicalization method. The signature method used to, to, uh, to uh, sign the metadata itself and some references describing the material that's being signed. Canonicalization method here, um, we're using um, exclusive, we're using the basic XML canonicalization there. What is canonicalization? You probably haven't heard of this if you haven't been working with XML signatures before. Um, this is how we get the one true bag of bits to sign. Um, XML kind of has a multiple personality problem. You have all these different representations that can mean essentially the same thing, parse out to the same node set, the same info set. Um, especially with things like um, binary encodings, we were talking about the fast info set or .NET TCP, you want to be able to have a message pass through multiple transports and uh, still have the same signature and not disturb the semantics. So to do that, we have to normalize white space, comments, C data, entities, coalesce adjacent nodes, and things like that. Um, this turns out to be a really incredibly hard problem, um, and lots of smart people have been working on it for years and not quite gotten it right yet. There's still some type 2 error. This isn't a problem from security, but anyway, it's worth noting it's a complicated algorithm. And this is where I want to kind of introduce the first theme here of the design review is uh, mismatched assumptions. Um, we're getting pretty good in the security community about thinking about sort of our, our grandma who doesn't know anything about computers and how to design security products that that she can use, that she can understand. Um, but I think the standards committees and architects and people who are experts um, have a ways to go yet and kind of appreciating well, you know, the average developer and how the average developer interacts with these security technologies and make some different assumptions than I think most people, most developers make. So the average developer and is lazy. And I'm taking myself from, say, a couple years ago here as the model for this. All great programmers are lazy. Um, the average developer probably cares about security. They're not, they're not, they want to do a good job. They want to do things right. Um, but the inner workings of how certificates and SSL and Kerberos work, um, whether it's the math or whether it's the, the details of the protocol are kind of just opaque. Um, and if you're a developer working, you have to trust the person who gives you the APIs because that's your job. You know, if every time your code doesn't compile, you think, hmm, maybe there's a compiler bug, you never get your, you get fired because you don't get your work done. Even if it is a compiler bug, it's your job to work around it. So you have to trust the API developer a lot. And where these assumptions start to fail between the average developer and the standards committees um, starts with canonicalization, starts with complexity and denial of service, and the attitude, I think, that was taken towards that in the building of the standard. Um, the standards committee seems to have been of the mind that this is XML, it's arbitrarily complex, so we don't have to worry about denial of service. It's just a given. There's nothing to be done. Whereas the security-minded developer doesn't necessarily like the complexity of XML, but is of a mind that if best practices are followed, um, it can be done safely. So what are those typical best practices? We might have all heard of them. Uh, not allowing DTDs, not expanding entities, not resolving external entities, limiting your parse depth, limiting your total input size. Once you've done this, it's actually not a bad assumption to say that for a given size chunk of XML, it's going to be relatively deterministic to parse it, turn it into an info set, figure out what to do with it. And having these kind of basic assumptions about how long it's going to take to process a message 
um, of a given size is pretty important when you think about the kind of architecture of systems today where we have managed code languages like .NET and Java, um, application servers running with thread pools, you need to be able to tune these performance characteristics. If you can't have any idea how long it's going to take you to process one given message, then you have no hope of designing a system that's resilient to things like distributed denial of service attacks. Um, and we'll see as we go on that almost all of these assumptions you're forced to violate by XML signatures. And then the average developer now who's been reading all the cheerleading thinks, well, now I've signed my message and it's safe so I don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. Now I have an authenticated message and I don't have to be careful about my parsing and handling of this data. And that guy's in for a surprise. So the first attack we have is entity expansion attacks, which is a well-known attack in the XML world, um, and which is why most parsers now ship with um, expand entities set to false, and it's the first thing people do in security reviews of XML code. Um, what you don't know is that when you go to canonicalize a signature, you have to expand entities, and there's no way around it. So if you're using a protocol that takes a DTD, um, which SOAP does not allow, um, but things like SAML parsers um, that take pull XML out of a web page or out of a web post might, um, you have to do this. So you have things like the old billion laughs attack where you define an entity recursively in terms of itself and this one little message here, this ampersand M, will expand to about two gigabytes and you know, denial of service to your application server. Um, even if you manage to prevent that, even if you're using, say, SOAP and you don't have DTDs available, um, this is just an expensive algorithm. Um, it takes a long time to process these messages. If you make a really complicated message, um, you can eat up a lot of resources. And the schemas do not limit how many times you can apply canonicalization. Um, it could be detected in an optimized way, but I've never seen an implementation that does this yet. So you can do something like send a message and just say canonicalize this 10,000 times. And you have to create a DOM and parse it and do all the coalescing and reserialize it out and over and over and over again. So every one of these is going to consume a large amount of system resources, and this is obviously trivial to construct. Um, the one thing here in canonicalization that's kind of crypto-y is that the interesting part of metadata and having an indirected signature is that the, the signature itself is never actually processed directly by your consuming application. Um, so it's a good target for hash collisions, because if you can create a hash collision there, without malforming the signature, your application is much less likely to notice that something's gone wrong or something's different there. Um, canonicalization supporting comments is not required, but almost every implementation supports it because comments are typically relevant in a lot of um, types of payloads. Are comments ever relevant in a signed info block? Um, I don't really think so because, again, it's just indirected metadata. Um, and allowing comments in the signed info block gives an attacker a lot of freedom to insert arbitrary amounts of arbitrary data into the message and try and construct a hash collision. I don't think this is actually a practical attack yet, but it's maybe only a couple years away for weaker algorithms like MD5. So moving past canonicalization, um, the next thing we'll move down to is the reference. So here we have our reference. Again, we're pointing down to our object at the bottom. References describe the content that's being signed, identify it with the URI, specify transforms to help canonicalize that content if it's XML, or to uh, refine your specification of what you're actually signing, and then specify digest method and value for that reference. Um, those references can either be a full document, they can be an X pointer, which you may not be familiar with. Um, our old friend, the uh, same document, HTML anchor, is what's called a bare X pointer. Um, you can have functions in this um, to identify content by ID, or you can have an XPath expression for it as well. Um, and you also can have external references. So you can say, this signature refers to some piece of content located at w3.org server. Um, in, the, in this context, um, a lot of tutorials you see about XML signatures will talk about enveloping, enveloped, and detached signatures. This just means it doesn't have any direct relevance to security properties, it just means whether the content is a child, a parent, or a sibling of the uh, signature element itself. But those external references that we talked about um, just failed one of our best practices again when we we're talking about complexity and denial of service. Um, if I can insert a malicious reference to a server and get you to chase it to try and validate the signature, I can drip data to you a little bit at a time, I can maybe try and get you to reveal forwardable credentials, 
um, you don't want the attacker to be able to control the outbound network properties of your server. So you want to be able to turn this off. Um, there's no simple default flag to turn this off in most APIs. You either need to um, supply a custom URID referencer, um, and you need to know that you need to do that. And there's no examples of, of how to do that in most of the code base that I've seen. Um, this also, when you introduce external references, introduces a time of check, time of use flaw. So if I check the signature and fetch some external content and canonicalize it and it works and it signs and is valid, and then I pass it on to my application, and my application goes and fetches that content again, how do I know that I got the same thing this time? Um, you don't. And this is especially problematic for things like um, XML security gateways that live on the network edge in a different device. Um, the way around this is to use cached reference retrieval, where you're going to actually interrogate the signature processor directly and say, give me the material you pulled off the network at the time of validation. Um, Java has an API to support that, but it's not on by default. Um, .NET does not provide any support, any support for this. Um, you can have a custom resolver in your XML um, that's going to store these references, but there's no way to get to the results of them after you've done all the transforms and canonicalizations, so it's still really hard to, uh, to do this correctly, and the APIs don't help you much. Um, again, this leaves you very tightly coupled to the object model of your signature processor if you have to pull the, the um, signed content directly out of it, and there's no good way to do this at all from an edge security gateway. XPath and XPointer are another way of referencing content we saw. Um, these can be complicated and resource intensive. Um, this is basically a, a language for doing tree navigation. Um, so you can go up one side and down the other and back up the other side and down the other and, and just you know chase pointers all day long through the DOM structure. Um, and they found in the course of designing the specification that this was becoming an inadvertent denial of service vector even for you know, well-intentioned messages, so they designed a new specification, XPath filters that would allow you to do unions, intersections of uh, content with multiple XPaths so you could performance optimize. But if you're the attacker and sending a malicious signature, this just means you can send dozens or hundreds or thousands of maliciously crafted, hard to parse, computationally intensive XPaths. So another uh, good denial of service tool there. Um, and another failure of the complexity assumptions about checking a signature and what that means. Um, web service security recommends against but doesn't forbid this. This is another case of the, the shoulds and the, you know, deviling in the details there. So the next theme I want to introduce here, which we're starting to get a, a hint of, is security's worst enemy is complexity. And we've seen, more of the, seen some of this. There's a lot more to come. This is not my quote, and I will attribute it properly at the end, but it's a good quote to keep in mind. Um, frisky references. So what if I've identified a reference just by ID? Um, or by an XPath expression. Well, it's taking just that element and signing it, not in the context of the document. So those can move around and not invalidate your signature. So this is very specific to document semantics, but let's take a look. Here we have a uh, catalog order. So I'm ordering a box of pencils in quantity one for $1.50, and I'm ordering 100 laptops at $2,500 a piece. And I don't want somebody tampering with my prices and changing it, because I know that old web trick. You know, I did that on web shopping back in 98. So I'm going to sign my prices, make sure that nobody tampers with those. But this document still validates with the same signature, because I've moved the prices around. But the prices are signed in isolation from the rest of the content. And so um, this still works. You don't even have to change the signature or anything. Um, you can also add and remove content. You could change anything else about the